Uh, welcome, everybody, and good evening. Uh, on behalf of La Trobe University, a very warm welcome to uh, this discussion in our Bold Thinking series. Uh, let me begin, though, uh, I think, uh, firstly, uh, and also importantly, uh, by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land upon which we gather this evening, uh, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and also let us pay our respects to their elders, past and present. I'm Tony McGrew, and I'm head of the College of Arts, Social Sciences, and Commerce at La Trobe. And it's a great pleasure to welcome everybody here this evening to this seventh event in our Bold Thinking series. Uh, tonight, the topic for discussion is really about schools and education and the education system and education principles. And as we all know here in this audience, this is an increasingly contentious issue, I think, in the public uh, arena. And it's a source of great public uh, debate. Our panel of experts will debate the question of whether an education revolution uh, is needed or required, and if so, what this might entail, uh, and also, uh, what would it mean for Australia's children and Australia's education system? And it promises, therefore, I think, to be a very interesting and hopefully enlightening discussion amongst all our panelists. Uh, I'm very proud to say that La Trobe is one of the nation's leading universities for teacher education. And undoubtedly, uh, those of you who have uh, read the newspapers this morning and listen to the radio and the TV will be aware that uh, teacher education and certainly entry standards into teacher education is part of that public debate. And in Victoria, of course, we now will have it by 2018, new legislated standards for entry into the profession. So uh, I'm sure that that will become part of the discussion uh, this evening. But also I think the discussion this evening will be about the skills for 21st century educators and learners and what lessons we can also glean from overseas. Because many of these debates here uh, are also really global debates about the nature of education uh, in a knowledge society. On tonight's uh, expert panel, uh, we have uh, Dr. Joanna Barbousas, who is uh, a, an associate professor, but also head of department in the School of Education at La Trobe. Joanna's research interests include teaching and learning, uh, particularly initial teacher education, professional development, and also knowledge formation in visual times. Joanna has over 20 years experience in teacher education, She's led significant teacher education initiatives with a focus upon workforce planning and also in the context of the current education and teacher education reform agenda. We're also uh, delighted to welcome adjunct professor Rosa Storelli. Rosa's uh, research area is educational leadership and management and she also is from the La Trobe School of Education. With more than 30 years in education, including 15 years as CEO and principal of a leading independent school, and numerous advisory positions in secondary and tertiary education, Rosa has a real and demonstrable history of transforming educational institutions into thriving learning communities. She's currently engaged in a range of national and international initiatives to improve the physical de design of schools, learning environments, and also teaching and learning practices. Joining uh, Joanna and Rosa is John Marsden. John has authored more than 40 books, mostly for teenagers and children, including, uh, and these are some of the titles, Tomorrow When the War Began, which I hope uh, is not a prophecy for the Trump era, but we never know. Uh, so much to tell you, which could also be about the uh, Trump uh, campaign, no doubt, and letters from the inside. John's passionate interest in education led him to start his own P to 10 school, Candlebark, on a vast forested estate near Romsey in Victoria. And the school's motto is take risks. And every day, students are to, to, to be found 
riding bikes, skateboarding, climbing trees, rolling down hills, and playing stick wars. It sounds a bit like a university, uh, John. But... And this year, John opened a second school, Alice Miller at Macedon, a year seven to 12 school with a particular emphasis on the creative arts. So I'm now going to hand over to uh, tonight's host, the uh, well-known radio personality, uh, Francis Leach. But would you all please uh, join me in welcoming and thanking tonight's panel. Thanks uh, for the warm reception, and we're glad you could be here for the latest in the Bold Thinking series. I just want to say, from my personal point of view, the reason why I'm here tonight, I could ever be here tonight, is because of a great teacher. I grew up in the northern suburbs of Melbourne, in Broadmeadows, in a housing commission community where my local Catholic school, which I was sent to, Therry College, now known as Panola, only went to year 10. Uh, I didn't have a library in my neighbourhood. That wasn't built till a lot later on, well after they built the police station, the magistrate court, and built a huge Centrelink. <laughs> you might laugh, but it's true. If they built the, first, the library first, there might have been less need for the others. Um, but I had a teacher in year eight by the name of John Kilner, who recognised in me something, and he encouraged me to read novels. He gave me a copy of Lord of the Flies and a couple of other books, and it changed my life. Um, a great teacher who I was then able to later in life in a professional sense, help him out and repay that, that debt in a way which gave me more satisfaction than uh, a lot of the other things I've done professionally. So if you are a teacher and you are here, on behalf of somebody like me, thank you. Um, and that's why tonight's really important, and that's why it's important also to define what today constitutes a quality education, what today what would in this day and age constitute that sort of experience. So I'll start, and we'll do this as a sort of state of the nation address of sorts. Start, and we'll go down the lines. Rosa, we'll, we'll start with you, just a minute or so, on what today would be, a, can, would be considered a quality education. Producing young people who can contribute to their world in a respectful and learned manner. So young people who've got civility, young people who are both creative, imaginative, curious and committed. Our schools need to produce young people with those qualities. John, what would you say as an addition to that? I'd agree to all that, of course, and add to it that we need to recognise that academic achievement and intellectual growth are not necessarily the same thing. And although schools emphasise academic growth and academic uh, acquisition of knowledge above all else, Intellectual development is of equal or even greater value. And so to produce young people who are thoughtful, able to reflect, able to weigh evidence and come to uh, sensible conclusions is something that the world urgently needs. John, is there anything else that you think could be added to that list of aspirational goals for education? So I think the word quality in itself um, kind of disrupts the actual agenda of what it means to engage with knowledge, with curiosity. I, I don't think there's anyone in this room who would not say, yes, I don't want quality. Of course, quality is what you know all educationists strive for. But I think it's contextualised of what it means at current times. What does it mean to, to position opportunities for curiosity, to take risks, to understand knowledge today different to what it was 30 years ago. How do you um, allow for young people and also people at different stages in their lives to engage with knowledge and their own learning um, within that space of curiosity? So quality for me, I think, is contextual. It's, uh, it has an, a, a kind of a currency and a historical space and we need to be careful how we use it because nobody would say we don't want quality. It's how you contextualise it at various times and where knowledge situates and the difference between knowledge and information. Uh, that's a good point. Uh, the whole premise of tonight though, whatever happened to the clever country, I mean implied in that John, is that we're falling behind. It's almost as if we accept that the, the, the educative experience in Australia is one that's slipping. Is that a fair assumption or are we maybe talking ourselves down a little? Well, it's a 
premise seized on with joy or relish, at least by talk show hosts and uh, tabloid newspapers. But when it's examined and unpacked, it's a very uh, superficial judgment. So the tests that these conclusions are based on are uh, very narrow tests. They test only a very small range of achievement. And they ignore some of the skills which are going to be most needed by adults in the 21st century. And that includes the ability to think on your feet, to be flexible, to be resilient, to be imaginative, to be socially intelligent, to be emotionally intelligent, to be able to relate to people in ways that are going to lead to good outcomes. So all those kinds of areas, in which I think Australian schools do pretty well on a world scale, are uh, ignored by the kind of tests that are quoted every year by the, the, the major organisations. I've forgotten the, the acronym. The OECD company, do it all the OECD, the time. yep, uh, which does its tests. That seems to be regarded as the only valid evidence in much the same way as so many people in Australia sees on that plan as the only valid test for whether a school is achieving or not. So how do we then measure it? I mean, if I look at the OECD results from May of 2005, mm. uh, Australia's ranked 14th behind the likes of Poland, Vietnam and Germany and other uh, data tabled in the report uh, for secondary school uh, in terms of maths and science. I mean, is that a, a reflection of anything that is real in the Australian experience, that we're slipping that far behind? Or is, or is John right lot, that the measure... The I should measure add, a lot of those marks fall within a very narrow range, yeah. so if a couple of kids got a few more marks, we'd be up to seventh or sixth or something. It's, um, so are we getting misleading information about, you know, before we can decide how to improve the education experience, we need to know what it really is. Yeah. So how do we do that? So I, I think the, the kind of data we need to actually measure quality and to measure accountability needs to be from a whole range of sources. Um, of course, those kinds of results are really important um, in terms of then looking at if, if we want to compare um, and position ourselves to countries who are at that top end and we actually examine their education systems, we actually do find that mm, we're not necessarily wanting to you know, go down that road of these kinds of structures. The, the, the opportunity to, to um, you know, to really examine the quantitative data around, you know, achieve, achievability and measurability of particular areas of knowledge, like literacy and numeracy, which are important, but how those actually reflect a better understanding about being adaptable and understanding knowledge from a whole range of discipline structures is, is a different thing. And how, I, I suppose my question in looking at these, at the data is what we need to reflect back is are we actually using money in the right spaces? So Which is something you... that Rosa and you and I had a long discussion about <laughs> exactly that the other we day. Did. We did. Because um, I want to reframe that, the context for that, a little bit differently. And I was going down more Joanna's pathway. People can say our NAPLAN scores are, change, are going down or our PISA results are going down. But I think the real issue for me is where is the equity of educational resources going in this country? And that's actually the real issue, and that's what we should be debating a little bit more. Not just a politician telling us our results are going down. There are so many fabulous schools, so many fabulous teachers, and I endorse them like you did there. But the quality of what's happening in every school is very, very different. Mm. And therefore, we need to be looking at our schools and saying, where does Australia need to focus its energy? Why are we getting a gap in educational outcome that is growing bigger and bigger between the haves and the have-nots? If our systems, our state system, our independent system, our Catholic systems all get money, they, that's OK. But we need to then target the money to where it should go, those students who are the most disadvantaged. And that's our problem in Australia. We are getting more and more students in Australia who are greatly disadvantaged. Well, I want to talk about that because we'll get to the Gonski model, which was central to that debate in the last couple of years. But before that, there was the building of the education revolution and the idea that you could pour money into the, into the, the school system and come up with results. So the program totaled $16.2 billion in total from about the 2008 budget onwards. Primary schools for the, for the 21st century was $14.2 billion, providing new and refurbished halls and libraries and whatnot. What did that money deliver us? That money delivered us buildings, full stop. Buildings 
can influence and change the way you learn and teach, but money needed to be redirected into good training, development, learning for teachers, I think. So I need think it needed to be targeted. That produced, that was a political, bureaucratic response to a global issue. It wasn't an educational response. And so the sort of buildings that were then built were buildings that we've always seen. So buildings of last century, not buildings of the so next it, century. So it didn't catapult forward an opportunity like, John, you might have used that money we for to a, develop a different kind a, of school. We had a wonderful building as a result of that program, which has been transformative in the way that we've worked with students in many areas. So I'm very grateful to that program. I think the results were vastly different in different schools and different systems. Mm -hmm. But we should also, and I'm no apologist for the government, but we should also recognise that that program was multi-purposed, if there is such a word. It was also to do with the economy and uh, employ, improving employment opportunities and so on and so on. So it was, it was not just about education. Yeah. But was it an opportunity, Miss, not to incorporate the, a more holistic approach to uh, improving the education experience simply than a stimulus package to help the building industry stave off devastation? Well, I, I actually, um, I don't know about a missed opportunity. I think it was an opportunity to actually think about the learning spaces. And I, and I think some uh, districts and some clustered schools actually did extraordinary work. Like what? Have thinking. you got an example for us of someone who maybe changed the, the way that they use their, their, uh, their learning spaces with that money? Um, well, I know that in uh, Bendigo there was, there was a real um, uh, move was. towards mm -hmm. um, thinking about the planning structure mm -hmm. around how mm -hmm. to renegotiate the, the learning spaces in the community. I know that in New South Wales there were some really mm -hmm. innovative primary schools that, uh, um, in the inner west that actually shifted the kind of assembly hall to a much more collaborative space. Um, I, I, I think that actually, you know, in a, in a political sense, yes, there were a whole range of other agendas around why this stimulus package happened, but we need to actually understand that the physical space of learning is different and it has to be... Yeah further modified and, and thought about. But I think the opportunity for now, you know, where to from here, and, and perhaps the missed opportunity is the research opportunities that could have come out of that. So research-based, you know, evidence-based research to understand then how do these spaces actually better position learning? How do they yeah. better position teaching? You wrote about that on a knowledge blog on the yeah. Latrobe University site today, and you basically said that the education model of the teacher and the student is still a sort of almost 19th century unilateral deliver, del delivery of information that needs to change. Mm. How does it need to change? And I'll, t I'll ask John in a moment you how you've changed it, but how do yeah. you see it changing? Or is it need, does it need to be um, horses for courses? It, it'll be different in different spaces and different uh, for different people. Yeah, and I think we have to be really... Um, uh, intelligent about that. It's not going to be, you know, um, everywhere the same way. It's about understanding that, you know, the, the 19th century model, and it is a 19th century model of mass education, which was absolutely necessary and it was situated within the Industrial Revolution. It was shifted the whole paradigm of society. We're now at a point at a, you know, cliche crossroads or whatever you want to call it, that the tokenism of the 21st century, we, we speak it, we're not there. Um, and the kinds of things is we have to really understand as, as systems, as teacher education providers, as individual teachers, as in, you know, people who engage with you know, knowledge in all kinds of forms, that the learner is a different learner today. So from early childhood to primary to to secondary, to tertiary, you know, the construction of the learning space is a very different space. So we as um, teachers and as teacher education providers need to think about and systems have to think about that's going to be our biggest challenge in the future. And we're not talking 20 years, we're talking the next five to 10 years. Well, John, you've already started that in a sense by what you're doing at your school, aren't you, is taking the education experience 
much more out of the classroom and into the lived experience. And you know, there'd be some people who actually thrive in that environment. There'd be some people who feel quite threatened by that as a scholastic experience. Can you tell us about that, about that? Yeah, I don't think anyone feels threatened by it, but they <clears throat> we're careful about it. We don't take people into to the South Pole or something if they've never had a night away from home before. We move them out of their comfort zone, but we do it with some support and a lot of thought. I think one of the things that we give children, which is of an importance perhaps not generally recognised, is we give them space. And in Australia, that's a luxury that we can afford to give every child, but we choose not to. And I hark back to what Joanna said about the Industrial Revolution model, that the model continues to be to take the greatest number of children possible, squash them into the smallest space that you can get away with, give them the fewest number of adults that you can, again, get away with to look after them, and then the rest of the workforce can get on, all the other adults can get on with earning money and working in industry and business and commerce and so on, mm. so that the children are safely out of the way for seven hours or so a day. And as long as we cling to that model, then we're not going to end up with a very effective education system or one that brings the kind of emotional and spiritual growth that we need to see in young people. I started saying, I don't know, 30 years ago that if we took, and I'm moving on to a different topic really, if we took the best and brightest of our young people and encouraged them to become teachers, then we would change Australia in one generation more profoundly than anything else that we could possibly do. But over the years, that hasn't happened. And one of the reasons it doesn't happen is because teachers themselves give the occupation such a bad press. So when year 11 or 12 students who might be bursting with enthusiasm say, I want to be a teacher, the typical response they'll get from their teachers is, oh, God, don't think about doing teaching. God forbid, yeah, anything but teaching. So we're our own worst enemies in many ways. But to... And I think what Molino said on the radio today and what he announced today in terms of a higher ATAR score for teachers is tinkering at the edges, but it's a, I think it's a good tinker. But um, nevertheless, there's so much more we can do. And Rosa and I were just talking about the fact that when we interview candidates for positions, some of them come into the room and there is an energy field that comes with them so that you kind of sit up in your chair and your eyes widen and you drink in everything they say. And that's quite an intangible quality but it's the kind of thing I look for when I'm employing teachers, and it's absolutely vital in any good teacher if they're going to communicate effectively and build good relationships with students. Yeah. I, do, I just wanted to add one thing that I am getting awfully sick of application letters, which begin with sentences like, burnt out as I am after 10 years of teaching, <laughs> or, or disillusioned after 15 years of teaching. And I think, why on earth would they think that's an attractive way to open a, <laughs> I want to hire burnt-out, disillusioned people? I don't think so. <laughs> Johnny? Rosa. Um, Rosa, sorry? No, that's OK. A couple of things came through as I heard my colleagues speak here. The first one is, I'm getting really tired of educators, all of us, sitting up and talking about the Industrial Re Revolution. We've been doing that for 20, 30 years. <laughs> and we then talk about, that school over there I know is doing something great, and that school over there is doing something great. And we should be ashamed to have to think of examples. Mm -hmm. There should be good people doing great things everywhere. Mm -hmm. And that's why I thought that was a lost opportunity. We could have done something great everywhere. I then get really tired when, a bit like John, people say, I oh, don't be a teacher. You've got to be joking. It's the best profession you can go into. Proudly be a teacher. And I'd challenge anyone in a school, any principal who advises a student not to be a teacher should be walking out the door themselves. And if any principal can't stand up in their school and say to every teacher, if you're not proud to be a teacher, then we actually don't want you. We don't have the luxury. Some schools do and some schools don't. But that's where we should be setting the benchmark. At the moment, we're setting an educational benchmark that's far too low. But it's not just the education sector. I mean, it's a reflection it not, of, of the, the wider culture and how it values the learning but, experience and the teaching But experience. that's why teachers have to stand up to people. Teachers have to have a voice. Teachers have to say, we do brilliant things in our classrooms. And we actually are the experts. So when the parent in the car park goes on, or the journalist goes on, or the politician goes on, the teachers have to be bold enough, mm. courageous enough to say, don't say that because your memory of that teacher was hopeless. I'm actually, 
I'm doing good things. And my school's doing good things. Which leads me to the point of how we get our teachers to do great things. Well, how do we do that? Because you talked, and we, we had this discussion, Rosa, as well, about the fact that teachers coming out of uh, the education system find it very difficult to get placements in schools. Schools are very tired uh, or very reluctant to, to help them in, uh, integrate into schools or have a learning experience. It's obvious that, in a sense, that the culture is that they don't value uh, their own craft enough to nurture it. Is, is that too harsh? So this is my bold idea. My bold, we have to have a bold idea, that's yeah. why we're here. <laughs> My bold idea is that instead of the Minister for Education saying today that you need to have a 78 R score, yeah. that's easy. That's a number. He can say that. What he should have been saying is that every single school in the country, the state, needs to take on a number of pre-service teachers because that's their professional DNA. They need to nurture the teachers. If you're a big school, you take on more. If you're a small school, you take on fewer. So you have to do that. Then every school has to only have their pre-service teachers or student teachers, because I'm old and that's what we used to call them, their student teachers mentored by the very, very best in those schools. And then there needs to be curiosity between the university and the school, because there's not enough curiosity both ways. Universities need to be more curious about the wonderful things that are happening in schools, and schools need to be more curious about the theory that underpins everything they do. And there needs to be mutual exchanges between the conglomerate of schools that have got connections with those universities and the ones here. And you get the quality of teacher rising, and we won't be sitting here saying, what's wrong with our schools? I'd just like to ask also, John, you say you got those letters from teachers who were burnt out. I'm sure that most of them didn't go into teaching thinking that that's what would become of them in 10 years' time. So, and if, you know, if Rose is right, that the nurturing of teachers and the professional development of teachers and a pathway to a successful career is, is you know, the way to hang on to good people, what needs to change for teachers within, within the school environment then? Yeah, there's a lot. And one of the things that I think would be very helpful would be if teachers were... Um, forced to have life experience before they came into the profession. So the idea of someone going straight from school to uni and then back into a school to teach is not one that I would ever encourage. So I've made appointments for next year already, of course, and uh, one of them is a first-year-out teacher, but she has spent three years in um, Colombia running a canoeing and uh, uh, canyoning business and has I suppose she's about 26 years old or something. So she's shown initiative. She's shown that she's got courage. She's been out there in the world. She's engaged with people. She's had to learn Spanish to open her own company in Colombia. And uh, so that's the kind of qualities that I look for, people who have lived adventurous lives, who've shown a creative spirit, and who have stories to tell. So if all teachers were required to have those kinds of experiences before they went into teaching, I think that would change the profession quite quickly. And I think also going back to that issue of space, if we were to close all the golf courses and convert them to school playgrounds so that instead of having a dozen or two dozen elderly white men overweight like me driving themselves on buggies around these 160-acre golf courses and instead made them available to the 600 kids squashed into the tiny play area down the road, then that would be a useful thing to do too. So they have a couple of bold <laughs> ideas that I'd like to contribute <laughs> to, to the point. Um, I, I'd like to kind of take up your point about um, the, the experience that one needs in terms of coming into teaching. I mean, I think the experience of an 18-year-old mm -hmm. and how an 18-year-old engages with their world and understands their world and critically engages with a whole range of practices within the school, outside the school. I mean, these kinds of attributes are actually something that I would like to see somebody coming into the profession. So I, I, I'm not necessarily one that um, experience on its own, so outside of the school, necessarily makes, uh, you know, the best recipe for a teacher to come into the profession. I think understanding... Um, you know, the, the kinds of nuances that an experience... And, you know, I, I see some extraordinary people who are 18 and 19 who 
uh, have the capacity to really change and understand you know, the context of education. They, they impress people in interviews and, and, and engage with younger people in ways that perhaps just because you've had a business doesn't necessarily make you the best teacher. But on, on the note of, you know, the promoting the profession, I think one of the things, you know, I've been in this space for a long time, the thing that blew me away a couple of years ago was um, front page, the age, a gorilla, you know, do you want this? Do you want this person teaching your children? So referencing to the teacher as the gorilla who is stupid and doesn't have literacy and numeracy, and we had a scholar from Ireland at the time who was horrified that this went without investigation. Mm. Nobody said a word, from our own profession to politicians. No one said a word. Just silence. It's okay to speak like that about teachers. It's not okay. Mm. Because the fact is, literacy, numeracy and discipline content, which I, I heard Alan Finkel speak about, you know, what does discipline mean in the context of interdisciplinarity? It is very important to have knowledge of specific areas, but how do you actually then teach somebody to use it and make sense of it? And, and to promote this image of a guerrilla teacher who has no sense of literacy and numeracy and we're okay to sit back, I think there's a huge problem. Can I ask about the idea that schools have had to become the repository for everything, yeah. in a sense that <laughs> communities have retreated from, I guess, a, a codependence in raising young people, in, in shared environments, um, uh, mutual responsibility to one another uh, within community. Families feel that they can now just uh, outsource uh, discipline, uh, basic life learning sk skills to school because they're time poor and some people are in circumstances where they can't take those responsibilities on. I mean, there's a hell of a lot of bu uh, buck passing here. Uh, where, do, where do teachers and where does the education system draw the line and how do we push back against that to, to say, hey, we can only do so much and we'll do it well, but hey, you need to take responsibility for your own stuff. Or is that too hard? Am I being a bit Ayn Rand here and no, saying, you know... I think, yeah. I think we've seen our society become much more vulgar. And we need different skills to help people deal with that. And then every time there's a new societal issue, because I think poverty, lack of educational access, leads to social disengagement, which all these issues come in. Just this week I've heard about teachers now having to assess on capabilities. That was early in the week on John Fain's show. Last week I heard <laughs> teachers now need to work on helping young people understand if they're getting sexually groomed for a predator. That was a new one that came through. I just was listening in my office thinking, teachers have to do everything, and of course they can't. And they can't do it alone, they have to do it in conjunction with the family and with other societal groups. So my thinking as an educator has changed a lot. You know, 10 years I would have said, we're educators and we're schools and we're the only ones that do this job because we do it well. Today, my thinking is much broader than that and saying that we need, in schools and education, work with so many other wonderful, wonderful groups who are in the educational space. And I'm thinking the Foundation for Young Australians or the Smith family, and I'm a director and I put that to the side, but they're doing amazing work, which I didn't know until I became involved with them. So there are so many of those issues that I think we actually now need to have a multi-pronged, um, I was going to say attack, but that's not the word we want, focus on dealing with this conglomerate of issues because schools can't do it alone anymore. They're John, much more complex. Do we ask too much of schools? Oh, it's overwhelming. It's like road safety, drug education, uh, IT uh, programming, coding, um, table manners was something I saw a letter about in the age a couple of years ago, so the schools should teach table manners. Uh, <laughs> We're expected to do something about the obesity epidemic by having more PE and more sport. We've got to teach foreign languages because apparently that's essential for everyone to have before they leave school. I was talking to the head of a big government primary school in Sydney the other day, and she said that on the staff now they have an OT, two, so, two speech therapists and three psychologists. And I said, so you're, you're a community health centre. Yeah. And that's happened 
quite quickly and without any public debate, yeah, really, or any discussion that's just evolved. But it, can I just jump in? It does feed back to what you were talking about before, and that is that 19th century model of school of being somewhere to put children while you go off and live your life. Yeah. Mm. So it's, yeah, it, it, that shows you where education is valued in the wider community, that it's not still prioritised as the most important experience that any young person can have. How do we change that? Because mm. before... I, have a go at that. The paradox of that is that we're then attacked for not teaching the three R's because at the end of the day, having covered all these other bases, there's hardly time for the literacy and numeracy that you mentioned earlier as being so mm. important. Mm. Yeah. And I think that's where um, there has to be some prioritising and, and how those priorities are actually um, you know, mapped in a collaborative way with a whole range of communities participating. I mean, there's fantastic work and a lot of mapping work currently happening in our regional campuses and our regional um, school partners, but some great work in Norway where they're, they're linking universities and schools and, and retirement villages and having these buddy-type structures and, and you know, um, reading groups. And, and so, so this community engagement of education so that it's not... Um, you know, really done, you know, it, it goes back to the, it takes a village. Yeah, and, and John, and, can I, sorry, because you talk sorry. about the, the need for authenticity in education, mm. having authentic experiences, which is what that is. Mm. And we, I totally agree with that, and we also go to the other end of the scale, and uh, there's a teacher at the school who had a baby two and a half years ago and started bringing her baby to school every day within a couple of months of giving birth, and so she has raised a baby in the school and uh, she's written articles about this for breastfeeding journals, about how easy that's been and how wonderful that's been for the whole school community. And Erica, who's now two and a half, nearly three, you would not find a happier baby because she has 150 kids who love her and play with her all day and interact with her all day. I know there was a moment uh, a couple of weeks ago when we were having a staff meeting and there were three or four year seven boys who were staying back and they were looking after Erica. And at one point, Donna, Erica's mother, got up to go and see how Erica was getting on. And she came back and she said, she's fine. She's in her pram and the boys are in a circle around the pram <laughs> sing, singing the theme song from Frozen to her. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a two-way benefit. Erica's getting the benefit, but gee, the whole school community is getting the benefit too. There's a, an enrichment that takes place from those kinds of interactions yeah. with older people and with, with babies and infants. Generational. Mm. And I think the word... The common theme here is that sense of community that can be nurtured with schools. And so you talk about your community. You're a very significant community in your area, though I'm sure people travel to come to you. Mm. But you go to Finland and everyone says, why is Finland so terrific? And they are in some things, but monocultural society. But they actually have community very highly valued and people don't travel to independent schools. They're all local schools and if you misbehave, for example, you can get a second chance in another local school, but not in your own school. So they have these really interesting nuances about keeping the community together, caring for you, not turfing you out if you're not performing very, very well, and keeping everything local. I, I think we've got a big problem here with our travelling to school. Because that creates other problems. And I know that's a random one on what the What do you side see as the here. major problem see, with I that? See the same, is that people aren't belonging to their local community anymore. They can go to their school community, but then they're only there for their school events. And I know that. I was in an independent school. So it was my career in that sense. But I can see a big disadvantage of it too. It, more cars on the road, for one. Kids who don't know how to catch their buses and their trams getting dropped off at the front door. Not knowing who's the neighbour two doors down because they're travelling to the school, but they know someone on the other side of town. There's some good things to that, don't get me wrong. But that sense of community isn't nurtured anymore. And I worry about that in a society that is now becoming so egocentric and so me, me, me. Oh, yeah, I think that that's community flawed is even more. in so, our school. So, that's that's so. definitely a problem that kids can't just hang out with the kids next door unless yeah. they've formed a relationship yeah. outside school. But those things, they, they actually changed the nature of education. Sorry, Joanna, please. Um, and I think also um, the nature of what a community means mm -hmm. and what's a healthy community yes. and what is not a healthy community. 
I think, you know, we really have to think about the digital communities that set up different kinds of engagement, that set up different kinds of opportunities um, for people who may find, you know, physical communities perhaps confronting or, you know, not right at that time. So how do we, um, you know, as educators understand you know, the importance of all kinds of communities and also understand that they're not necessarily healthy all the time. Um, and how do you actually situate a critical, you know, uh, approach to actually examining a community structure? Because, yeah, it's, I think we, the we biggest, need to be careful with the that. The biggest problem in community is one we haven't even mentioned, and that's the online community that kids are now using yeah. as a replacement for the... Well, how do you deal with that in your school, John? Well, we're pretty uh, prescriptive about what kids are allowed to do in terms of using electronic devices. So we've just had our year nines came back on Friday after six weeks travelling through France and Montenegro and Serbia and so on, and they weren't allowed access to any of those devices during that time. And during the trip, different kids would wander up to the teachers who were taking the group and say to them, yeah, I get it now. I understand why you've um, stopped us using those things. So they discovered things like conversation and <laughs> board games and sitting around a table long after dinner had finished and talking animatedly, things which we take for granted, but 15-year-olds uh, are almost so unused to. Because technology novels. can be an enormous advantage in delivering an education experience, sure. but how do we find the balance between it being a, a value-add and not an impediment? A, a very, very skillful teacher can integrate yeah, it beautifully. Right in the classroom mm. and know when it's not to be used and encourage our students to be critical thinkers. Mm. But the reality of that is our young people will be on their devices 99% of the time. So you do need to be prescriptive at time. But I think what we're not recognising is that, you know, when we go back to what we should be doing, we should be investigating the effect of all of this on our young people's interactions the lack of conversation. You talked about the conversation. I think that's something that's really underestimated. If you go, you know, that would be right up there as my number two quality that we need to develop in young people, the art of conversation, because so many of them have lost it. The money's the one thing that we haven't talked about, and I know we need to, because in the end, nothing happens without money. Follow the money's my rules of journalism. Well, I don't know about that. You can do a lot with imagination and a bit of ingenuity. So I reckon you'd, you'd probably need a lot of money, though, to, to, to actually, you know, for, for, the, for the education system to work. It, it needs, as you said, equitable funding. I think... But how, how, is, how do you see that? Or I'd like to go down the line and, and ask, because people have different philosophies on this. How do you see public money and how should it be used in the education system? Public money should be going to the people who need it the most, to the students who need it the most. We've got a number of groups in our community who are very disadvantaged. So we've got our Indigenous community, our students with disabilities and our students in remote areas. And the gap or the educational opportunities for those people is very, very different to the ones who, who are able in well-resourced schools. So our money should be going to those people. John, those uh, students. Your, your school, what's, what's, the, what's the funding mix at your school like? Well, we get uh, quite good Commonwealth and state government funding and we charge parents about 13000 a year, which covers everything, stationery, textbooks, lunches, all food, all these trips except the big six-week trip overseas. But they go to Mona Gallery in Hobart. There's a group going to Sydney next week. There's a group goes to WOMED every year and all of that's included in the school fees. So I'm at a loss to understand the fees charged by the big Melbourne independent schools. Um, but that's kind of a footnote. I think the biggest uh, need in Australia with this, for young people in Australia is the uh, extent of emotional illness, which is at pandemic proportions, pandemic levels. And uh, if I was applying funds anywhere, it would be to start the long-term project, and it would be a long-term project, of working on uh, addressing these mental health issues which are causing such devastation right through the community, not just in young people, of course, but uh, it's becoming such a huge public health issue and it affects learning and classroom interaction and social development and relationships and in every possible way. Do we have a two-tiered system at the moment of opportunity between independent schools who charge a fortune and have incredible assets and, and public schools? Is it that simple or is it a, is it a mix of experiences? 
I, th I don't think it's as simple as that. Um, I'm going to take a teacher education focus to the money question um, because I think there's an opportunity here if we're, if we're really going to do what Molino's put forward and what happened in New South Wales um, a couple of years ago and sort of positioning an agenda in education and we have a, a national, national standards around teachers teacher standards and program standards. I think this is an opportunity to really think about how funding, so this is, you know, taxpayer money funding of professional experience is actually used and better considered. Um, so if we're, if we're really, really pushing the boundaries of communities and who's owning teacher education and who works with the growth of our new teachers and how can teacher education providers and schools work collaboratively to, you know, um, disrupt the theory practice issue, um, professional experience funding needs to be completely revolutionised so that, you know, and we're talking significant funds can be conceptualised to really situate a community of practice in the way we understand, you know, the, the kind of the theoretical dimensions that everybody needs to engage with in terms of knowledge and traditions in, in education and what you need as your little toolkit and then the practice that you are, you know, set to um, be put into your partner schools and then how those experiences actually allow for uh, practical wisdom to, to, so that you can arrive with practical wisdom so that you can be adaptive. So the, the funds in which you know, um, how professional experience money, which actually goes to every teacher education provider, needs to be reconceptualised. And that's something that we've pushed as, you know, uh, many deans and um, um, through councils of deans to kind of say, um, at a federal level, we need to go there because it's in that space that we can actually reposition particularly in a, at a graduate level, how we engage with teacher education from a university um, and schools. So not the UK model, but a completely different way of thinking about practice. In schools themselves, are we seeing an opportunity opening up with, with a, a different approach to teaching it, uh, as Joanna describes it? Are we seeing any evidence... I think we, I think we are, but what we absolutely we are, but what we're not seeing is that change across the whole board. Okay. So you're seeing it in pockets, and that's the inequity. We have a bigger problem, I think, about the different quality of teachers within schools than between schools. What do you so mean by that? If, so if you go to any school, you'll see a wide range of teacher quality mm. or teacher performance, whatever word you want. And we need to make sure that everybody in every school lifts their standards. How do you do so that? So we then? have through the professional development and the um, professional learning, and I think the m more connection between schools and universities. There has to be more, I use the word curiosity about each other, but more interchangeable learnings from one another. And I think that's what we're trying to do in universities, but each university is doing it differently. And each university has um, different amounts of funding to do things differently too. But the teachers will want a career path and will want professional growth as well. Yes. I mean, how do, you, how do you build that for them? Is it just the case that if you're a good teacher, eventually you'll end up out of the classroom and in a principal's no, office no, no, or a head of department? Nothing should be by chance. It shouldn't be. Good teaching shouldn't be by luck. It should be planned, developed, learned over many, many years. It's, it's sustained. a craft. How do you... And sustained. And sustained, I think, by getting the rewards back rather than the knocking that we often hear, but you have to have professional learning communities who support their teachers, and that comes from the leadership in the schools. Mm -hmm. Teachers will be well supported and happy in their environment if they've got leaders who are encouraging what they're doing and supporting what they're We've doing. We've got a leader of school. How has it been teacher retention at your school? I'd imagine that when you find a good teacher, you want to hang on to them. How do you make sure you do? Because I hire adventurous people, they sometimes leave after yeah. a few years to have more adventures, but they tend to come back. <laughs> and uh, so really no one has ever left the school to, to teach in another school. They've left to go and convert a olive mill in um, Montenegro into a cultural centre. They've left to go teaching in Fiji. They've left to do a master's in Finland. 
but two of those three people I just mentioned have come back, and I think the third one will in a couple of years. So it's uh, all part of their, the healthy growth of their individual lives, which will then flow on into their professional development. But there's a, a kind of misunderstanding by bureaucrats, which is that if you have incompetent or lazy or destructive teachers, and we do, of course, as every profession does, the way to deal with that is by greater regulation, bringing in more regulations. And all that does is penalise the good teachers who have to slave even harder to comply with those regulations, whilst the lazy, destructive or incompetent teachers continue to be lazy, destructive or incompetent because they always find ways to continue to be... Like in any bureaucracy. Exactly, absolutely. And so that's just so suffocating. You asked before, why do teachers burn out? I think that's one of the main reasons they go into teaching because they want to be in a classroom working with students, but they spend so much of their time in meetings and uh, filling out paperwork and writing reports and, and doing stuff which is really so unrelated to teaching that they end up frustrated and, and disappointed. Just before we, we are going to open up the floor to questions, so we've got a couple of microphones and we'll, we'll get you, uh, give you an opportunity, I should say, to ask and, and join the conversation. That news today about the changing uh, approach to the ATAR score, lifting it, uh, basically setting a high standard for students coming out of uh, high school to become teachers. Yeah. My argument to that is that somebody who's got a 78 task or already has the option to choose teaching. Mm -hmm. So it seems self-defeating in a sense that if they haven't already done that, then there's a, the, pro the, pro the problem is they're choosing, they're actually exercising choice not to. Simply raising the bar to, to there is not going to change that. So where is the change in that dynamic? What does it achieve? Mm. That's a good point. Um, I, mean, I heard it went, so you're telling people who've already chosen not to be teachers that they cannot be teachers again? Yeah. Yeah. The, the ATAR argument is, is um, a, you know, one part of the argument in terms of thinking about an entry requirement. Yeah. Um, you know, you can't think of the ATAR in a simplistic way. There are many kind of interpretations and, and many um, nuances to it. I mean, you can't forget that it has a marketing dimension and de demand dimension to it. So it's think, important, you think? Yeah, it is important to... Absolutely, it's important. It adds a bit of prestige to the... Um, yes, it does. But what I think what we need to be really clear about is the, dis the disposition of a teacher, just because you're a 90 or a 99, doesn't actually make you the best yeah. teacher. Yeah. So or how the best doctor or the best or the lawyer. Best, that's right. Yeah. So how do we... How do we actually, um, you know, use this? And, and, and that's where uh, governments need to be really careful, that they're understanding that this is one part and there are all sorts of other kind of attributes that, that fall into what makes a good teacher. And what you come in with as opposed to what you go out with is, is what isn't spoken about, and I, and I know there's a whole range of political agendas there, but essentially, you know, uh, if a teacher education program is focused on a developmental, um, you know, process, um, whether it's a four-year or a two-year degree, um, it really is about, you know, situating the, you know, literacy, numeracy, um, you know, talking about the dispositions and the... Um, the kind of capabilities that actually, at the end of the day, what we want to have are, you know, teachers who have practical wisdom, who are adaptive, who understand their craft and understand what discipline knowledge means to them in this school, in this school, in this school. And be proud of it. Look, I just want to go along the line and finish on this one too, because we've spoken about a lot of the problems and challenges, but before we open it up to questions... What is it that you love and what excites you about the future of teaching? What are you looking and go, wow, I, I hope I can be there when this happens or I want to see this happen and it won't it be amazing? Well, uh, mine's nothing amazing like that. I just want to see every school well-resourced with teachers who love, get the buzz out of seeing every student achieve to the very best of their potential. Mine's simple. That's what I want for every school because even though my education, my profession was in independent schools, I'm a bit ashamed that we have 30% of our population in independent schools in this country. Mm. And I'd have to say that because I just don't think that helps us get everybody to the level which we should. John? So every school. I think it's that daily wrestle with the kids whose lives are chaotic, who have been damaged and who have 
academic, social, emotional damage and uh, trying to help them move towards a better place so that their chances of a successful adult life are enhanced. And that daily wrestle is gruelling. I go home exhausted, as does any worthwhile teacher, but uh, that's what keeps me going. And when you see the outcomes, it must be amazing. When yeah, there are mirac well, matter, miraculous, they take a long time, but there are complete transformations sometimes. We don't get that all the time, but we do see at times a wonderful evolution. John? Um, I want to see the um, emission of the gorilla images mm -hmm. um, with, you know, uh, expansive images of, of people doing inspiring things, of young teachers, older teachers, men, women, engaging in teachers, in teacher education and in education with pride and respect and status. That would be my, my wish list. And that's a two-way street for teachers and also the communities yeah. they serve to acknowledge that, isn't it? Absolutely. All right, over to you. We've got microphones. Uh, Peter's got one over here. I think we've got one over there. Just uh, throw your hand in the air, introduce yourself, uh, direct your question uh, to one of our panellists and let's start the discussion. Yeah, we'll start with you, my, my name's Christopher Heathcote. For quite a few years, I ran a tertiary art school. I want to throw a question, straight question in. I keep hearing all over the place, we want students when they finish secondary school, we want them to be creative, and Rosie, you said it. On the other hand, um, John was talking about it's very important for teachers also to be imaginative. And I simply know that at times you get stuck in positions and all sorts of problems are going on. And a bit of imaginative flair can actually sort out all sorts of problems. You don't always need money to fix things. You sometimes need some staff who are imaginative. And I know that imagination is very, very important. But I'd like to ask people what do they mean and what do they think that this thing is that they expect of students who are creative. But before I throw it back to you, can I say something to every teacher in the room as a former head of an art school that I find really frustrating and everyone in art schools found frustrating? If you teach in a government school, there's a tendency that most of the students get one trip to the National Gallery of Victoria <laughs> in their secondary education. Um, that's if they're in a government school. If they're going to an independent school, they'll actually go quite a lot. But in a government school, they tend to get the one... Yeah, we, we've got a lot of questions to yeah. get through, so we'll get I to I was just going to say, and what do they see? They go to see top arts. If your students are going to the National Gallery of Victoria, please make sure they see the collection and not waste their time looking at top arts. Mm -hmm. Any anyway, rate, creativity, what do you mean by it? Well, for me, it's giving people the opportunity to respond to situations in a way that's an original response. So you need to give them th area, things to problem solving. You need to give them opportunities to respond physically, pictorially, literally, but to respond to, in a way that is authentic to them, not a prescribed response. That, to me, is creation. I think it comes from having a strong sense of self, and with that as a foundation, you then approach the world in a unique way, and you see things with your own eyes, and interpret them in your own way, and contextualise them in your own way. And it also involves a knowledge. Someone said of um, Einstein once there was some conversation, and someone said, "Oh, the thing about Einstein was he could think outside the box." And someone else replied, "Yes, but Einstein knew what was in the box." Yeah. <laughs> and I know in my main area of interest, which is English, I want students to be creative and use language inventively and with freshness and with energy and with a strong sense of their own voice. But I also want them to know how to spell, how to punctuate. Yeah. I want them to know how syntax works, because only by having that knowledge can you then break the rules and you know when to break the rules and, and how to break the rules. Is it that also that, that tension between uh, our tendency for a vocational education and the phrase that politicians love to use, getting young people to be job ready, uh, and, and the, the willingness to allow people to have a different way, a pathway in their education? Mm. And how do you quantify it? Because I want to be able to measure it whether you like it or not. That's mm. the way of the world. That's mm. what NAPLAN is, I guess, in a sense. So how do you, how do you find that balance? Um, I, I think um, 
really thinking about the balance of the creative space and the accountability space or the measurability space. It's actually about um, how do you allow for somebody to access their own ideas and at the same time be able to examine the discourses that actually got them there yeah. in the first place. Um, you know, I was a visual arts teacher. That was what I did when high school teacher at visual arts. One of the things that used to really blow me away in information nights to convince your year 10s to take up visual arts is everyone would say, but I can't draw, I can't paint, so I can't do visual arts. So to understand creativity is to actually understand the role of ideas in the way you shift um, a discourse or you shift the way you know, a practice or a discipline understand itself. So really for me, um, to engage with somebody creatively is to give them the opportunity to access and to, you know, look in the box, see what is in the box, and then how does that box allow you to do different things in different spaces? I think we have a question over this way. Do we? Great. Thank you. Hi, my name's Judith, I'm a teacher librarian. John, I was wondering how teachers at your school approach reports. Well, we ignore them pretty much. And, um, <laughs> I'd have a sort of, a lot of happy teachers down here. With that. <laughs> I, was going to take, I was going to take issue with Joanna before when she talked about the importance of measuring things and uh, Francis mentioned the same thing a moment ago. And I don't think that we need to measure all the time and evaluate. I think it's a waste of energy. It's uh, often... Uh, meaningless, and there are much better ways we could spend our time. So we give letter grades twice a year because we're legally required to do so. Occasionally a teacher will add a written comment to a letter grade, and if they give below a C, they are required by me to give a comment. Uh, parents can make appointments with teachers any time to have a chat about how their student is going, and some do and some don't. But uh, that's the extent of our reporting. Wow, where were you when I needed you when I was growing up? <laughs> <laughs> well, we figured that the parents who are really interested in their kids will know how they're doing, and the, ki the ones who aren't won't read the reports anyway, so we're not... <laughs> there's, whichever group we're writing them for, it's a waste of time. I think we, we'll go P.I. over to your side of the room. Um, hi, my name's Johanna Petkov. Um, as a graduate teacher, I find... Um, the number of short-term contracts available mm -hmm. very disheartening and creates a real feeling of uncertainty. Um, and we were basically sort of told at university if you're in an oversaturated discipline like English or history, we'll basically suck it up, um, which is not that encouraging. Um, I was just wondering, how do you think that these short-term contracts and probably high staff turnover impacts school communities and students um, and what ways do you think we might be able to tackle that to make us want to stay in the profession more as well? What a great question, because it goes oh, to the heart of God. what you value yeah. about a teacher, isn't um, it? Yeah. Maybe I'll start and you yeah, can go for it. I've mm. been in a big school with a lot where you have lots of short-term contracts or whatever, and it's demoralising for mm. the teacher, for the person just like you. Um, <clears throat> Often people don't understand why you have them, and there are a lot of reasons. You know, extended maternity leaves, where I'm a great supporter of maternity leave, but you need to keep the position open until the person, the young person is five. You can, so you can't offer ongoing positions. So there are reasons for the short term contracts, and I don't have an answer for it other than if you want to be a teacher, Keep doing the contracts, keep applying, and I hope for you that you get your full-time ongoing role. But it, it must be hard. I mean, there must be some really good hard. people it's being lost. To... It's, it's very hard, but you can't yeah. just get rid of staff. No. It's not easy to turn over the staff who aren't performing. But but hiring someone on a short-term basis to replace someone who's on leave or whatever, that's one thing. But to keep people on short-term contracts year that's after illegal. year... That's actually can be illegal. Well, governments seem to indulge mm. in it, and mm. it seems to be immoral, mm. if not illegal. And mm. uh, I think political action is the only way it'll ever be changed yeah. at a grassroots level. Joanna? And I, I think, um, and thank you for your question and comment, um, I think the issue around um, the casualisation of, of employment is something that, you know, politicians kind of want to go blah, 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 when they talk about retention. Um, you know, there's, there, that, that is a very different story today to what it was 20, 30 years ago, where 
you know, you do a teacher education diploma and you get employment. And um, you had tenure basically at a school? Uh, pretty much, uh, depending on your state, but pretty much. Uh, I think what, what happens now is not only are there short-term contracts, the expectation, I mean, we did this, you know, interesting kind of broad research of our local principals. What principals and teachers want graduate teachers to do is almost the equivalent to a 10-year experienced teacher. Oh. So if you want that, then you pay them at that level. Um, and, and that is a real issue for, for young, vibrant, um, you know, uh, graduate teachers who have an extraordinary breadth of, of knowledge and content. Um, and, and that is an issue. That is an issue that politicians and, and I think, but it, it's a social issue as well. Well, it is. I mean, you talk, we've talked a lot up here about the idea of community, both within school and without. And yeah. if you don't have people actually being invested in that school community yeah. to get to know one another and feel like they have a stake in the lives of both their students and the school community, how do you even begin to grow that? No, you don't. And then flip it around for the students. It's not very good either because we know that the best thing for any student is to have long-term connections with people, mm. not lots of short-term connections, because you need to get to know the student, they need to get to know you, you, you're, you build up that trust, you're there for them, you see the growth and development. You know, we see Francis going from a naughty boy to a good boy, we get all of that. But you have to have that long-term, that long-term You should have seen me, Rose. I was I can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But that's really important to have that continuity, and that's why... Another issue we didn't talk about, that's why teachers will always be needed and they won't, our schools will not be run by robots. I don't believe. Yeah. I don't believe. Because that human touch is vital and that long-term contact with our young people. Well, it's a frightening vital. dystopian idea that it needs to be mechanised because it's surely about the human experience. It's about feeling, seeing, experiencing each other and understanding the nuances of behaviours. We have some more questions from the floor. Just, uh, we'll go to the back, then we'll come over this side. So. Hi, uh, my name's Phoebe. This is actually for Rosa. Hi, Phoebe. Um, hi. <laughs> I've been working with Alzheimer's Australia for the last three years and I've seen a shift in funding which went from something where uh, providers were receiving funding to where individuals were receiving that funding and the providers really had to work mm. to get them to come. Mm. So is that the type of thing that you're suggesting with schools yeah. is that individual students yes. receive this funding? Absolutely. It's My we, question yeah, in, yep. on that is then the impact on schools of different sizes, of schools rurally or in the CBD? But if the funding stays with the student, the student can then access the resources that they need with the support of the school. But at the moment, the schools get funded, not the individual students. And, and I believe it should be with the needs of that student. So it's a needs-based Because one of the things model. that happens at the moment is, is if your school is funded for an aid to work with a severely disabled student, that aid could spend all day photocopying and making coffee and so on for the staff, and that's considered a legitimate and, and legal use of the aid's time. So it is um, it's a kind of very difficult area to work out. Each school yeah. seems to have a different yeah. policy on that. Yeah, everyone's school, but it shouldn't. I mean, if I ask the audience here, how many of you know a student who's dyslexic? It's everyone, surely. Oh. Or nearly every one of us would know someone yeah. in our immediate family or not. And I've just chosen that as a, yeah. a random thing. But to get assistance for that student, the schools have to apply for it. The school may get it or may not, depend, but it needs to be very, very targeted to that student and the sort of support that student needs. It's a neurological disorder, not an educational disorder. That's or, being addressed, or trying to be addressed in the school environment. Yeah, and it's very specific. So we need to change our whole system on how we fund them, but we also need to have our governments doing research in what are some of the things we need to be doing to help our students with disabilities, for example. That's where our money should be going. What are the things happening overseas? Why aren't we doing that in Australia? Instead of just saying, our kids with disabilities, because whatever system we have, whether it's whatever system, we're not, we're not meeting the needs of a big sector of our young people. We have, uh, we'll come to the front in a moment, but I think we, there was a question up the back here.
Hi, my name's Leanne and I'm a teacher as well. I wanted to ask how you feel about the age at which children start school in this country. I know there's been some controversy recently because some states are considering lowering, lowering the age. I'm curious about what the panel thinks. It, it's, for me, it's um, a, a, tri a tricky one because we all know young people develop so differently. So they need to be school ready, not four or five or six. But research in other countries tell us that it is advantageous for our young people to start later. And we start earlier than other countries and we don't invest in our early learning as much as we should and maybe we need to have government funding for two years of preschool. So it's not so much an age issue as a developmental stage issue, I think. John? I don't think it matters. It depends on what you are doing with them during those years at school. So they can start at three if they're playing and forming relationships and uh, learning to navigate their way through the world like in, in our, on our campus, it's the world of the forest and the paddocks and the stock and so on. Um, if someone's standing over them at the age of three saying that six is back to front, then that's obviously a toxic way to, to approach education. So it depends on what they're doing. So the Christian brothers used to do it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Cane in hand. And I, I, uh, I think, yeah, sorry. oh sorry. No, yeah, yeah. I think uh, six, is, five and a half, six is probably pretty good at, uh, for most kids, but as Rosa says, they do vary dramatically. And there's so much rich research in uh, early learning around the kind of uh, learning opportunities through play-based learning that um, actually position a learning culture, but um, that's different to schooling. So, you know, we, we need to kind of um, debate what schooling actually means for a, a young person to, um, you know, somebody moving on. But that starting age is a carryover from the thing we talked about before, is that sort of industrial pre post-industrial revolution idea of schooling, the 9 till 3.30 or whatever it is model as well, which is part of that as well, which doesn't reflect anyone's lived experience these days. Mm -hmm. Are we going to be brave enough to change the nature of the school day itself? Well, some schools Ooh. have and some schools yeah, have started have later and mm. some schools do st mm. staggered. Yeah. But I don't, what I haven't seen, and I think we should be moving towards those developmental groupings, so those mixed groupings as opposed to chronological age groupings when you go through, so you might have a set of capabilities or outcomes, you might have different entrance, um, and interests almost as the student moves through. You know, I know that I have got a, you know, a child who does year 10 history, but is a year eight mathematics. So they go through in a developmental stage in big community hubs where you bring in older people to help, you bring in industry, and you become those centres of learning as opposed, opposed to schools, which conjure up a very fixed idea for people. Yeah. I think there was a question down the front here. Stand up. My name's Anna and I'm a second year teacher and uh, I'm in the secondary school. And one of the things that has really been weighing on my mind lately <coughs> is the ATAR score being the end point. And I'm wondering if universities are starting to look at different methods to assess and analyse the way that students will be accepted into different courses. Um, because I think until perhaps that's really looked at, the, that's creating the box for is. learning. Mm -hmm. Joanne, I think you're the expert there. Oh, well, Melina talked about that said, today and yeah. said that you know, they'll find other ways of mm. assessing people's readiness for teaching and their aptitude for teaching. And I don't know how they'll do that. It'll take a lot of personal interviews, I imagine, but it'll be a kind of fairly uh, I'll interesting give you, to see how just, it I, I, That makes me laugh because when I went to... I did HSC. God, that's how old I am. Uh, yeah, and then applied for the media studies degree across the road. Um, which I love doing, but it consisted of an interview with Rob, the late Rob Jordan, great cinema studies teacher, who basically sat there and said, so what movies do you like? Uh, <laughs> which Lou Reed record is your favourite? And, you know, basically that was it. If you got the answers right, you got, you got in. Because they had a, thousands, it was a series of questions like that. But it was about, you know, what, how do you think about the world that way rather than... So there was, I, I had a good HSC score, but there were plenty of kids in there who, that I went through university with who, who didn't even do... HSC, mm -hmm. but they were perfect for the course yeah. and course flew they through it because they, they got it. They knew what they were going to do when they got there. Mm -hmm. Sorry, it just made me laugh. The interview thing was, was great. I loved it. Yeah. The ATAR score is so specific in what it's measuring. Mm. Mm. 
And what it does to you as a teacher is it makes you narrow the focus on what you're teaching to do the right thing by the students so they can get that ATS score to go on. Mm -hmm. And you absolutely, that's the issue, isn't it? That's the issue. And you, so the concentration becomes very, very, very narrow. And we say education is about expanding and lifting your sights, but our schooling system and our university entry makes it very narrow. I mean, what's really interesting in schools, the most innovative and, you know, I'll, I'll talk about secondary schools in this example, the most innovative kind of pedagogical, you know, um, experiments actually happen in year eight, year nine. Mm. And then the moment you're kind of hitting that ATAR, you know, um, space from year 10 onwards and you're moving into senior school, the, the shift from, from a, a, a kind of an inquiry approach, problem solving, all of a sudden you have this, you know, trajectory that is about the study guy and... Syllabus. And, mm. Yeah, and, wow. and that is, I think, um, um, an interesting move happening around the world around the, you know, um, dissolving of subjects. When you're looking in, in North, Northern Europe, let's get rid of subjects. How amazing would that be? You're not getting rid of content or knowledge, you're actually reconsidering the idea of discipline so that the subject, I mean, if we're talking about revolution, you then can have those opportunities for pedagogical exchange, which is more than just, you know, we need to have these, you know, mm. this study guide needs to be addressed and these, these um, facts need to be positioned. But I'm interested, John, you say you're starting that year, uh, secondary school experience and that creative experience that you're offering. At some point, some kids are going to go, well, I do want to go and study law, or I do want to do medicine, yeah. and they're going to have to find a way into that experience that you talk about. And whether they like it or not currently, it is going to be about nailing down your ATAR score, knowing your syllabus, getting it right in an exam, and then getting the mark. I mean, how do, how do you get them ready for that? Uh, the, what we're, everything we're doing is getting them ready for that and other successes in life too. If any door in life is closed to our students because we haven't prepared them effectively, then we have failed. So whether they want to be a diesel mechanic or a, a, a neurosurgeon or a hairdresser or an airline pilot, we have to equip them to be able to have those doors open when they knock on them. So we do put a lot of stress on high quality academic teaching, but because we don't have behavior issues in the classroom, the time spent in the classroom is very productive, mm -hmm. so we can spend fewer hours in the classroom than in other schools, but also our kids are alert, they're energised, they're wide awake because all that running around and climbing trees and rolling down hills means that they're not depressed, flat, flat lining like some kids appear to be when you see them uh, on their way to school in the mornings. When you go past a bus stop in the Macedon Ranges, you'll see many kids in their school uniforms looking alienated and depressed at the thought of another day of school. You'll see our kids chasing each other around and when the bus arrives, they rush to get on the bus. Because and they've had the choice. They've made the choice to go to your school. Well, their parents have and, made the or choice their parents for have. them. And the they, word choice, they've had choice. Mm. But once they're at school, they have Correct. a lot of choice and Yes, they do. And the I think that's wonderful and that's what we table. want. But mm. not every kid in our country has choice. No. But and that's our issue. That's why, if I can get it back to why we need that education revolution, is because not every kid has the opportunity through parents who value your sort of education, which I applaud and admire and would love, but wouldn't we want every child to have that sort of education? But what's interesting to me is that when teachers from other systems come to visit, and we have visitors almost every day, they, at the end of the day, will stand there and say to me, oh, we'd love to do this at our school, but... And then they list the reasons that they can't do it. And we come back then to what you said earlier, that teachers have to be better advocates for their own profession yes. and have more confidence and courage yeah. Yeah. in saying to people, mm. we know what we're doing and we are doing in our school what will most benefit your son or daughter to equip them to become successful adults. Yeah. And you have to, at some point, trust them, yeah. trust us to do that. Yeah. And that's something that teachers are very poor at doing. Oh, my God, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Thank God that's you. <laughs> so nice to you. Yes, yes, yeah, well, yeah. I blame Francis for not banning phones at the start of the session. You know. I just presumed as a teacher you would have it off. <laughs> they're allowed to, to, have, they're allowed to in your school. I just wanted to...
when I was listening to the first part of the conversation, say something about the Minister's um, announcement today. But just in regards to that point about ATAR scores shouldn't be the be-all and end-all of getting, especially into university, today they're not. That's already the case. I don't know what it is in education, but I know that in law or medicine, Students who went to John's school would be welcomed by every single uni with a medical or law student and they would interview them and they would value that experience. Yeah. Yeah. So we've got a lot of models where students yeah. Yeah. get to go into for, uh, you know, further learning without reference to that ATAR score. Yeah. But That's in true. regards to the yeah. announcement that the Minister made and you were talking about how do you what do you do with people who have already made the choice not to go into teaching? That statement made me think about it in a different way, in that perhaps mandating a minimum ATAR score of 70 says what we're saying is that we want people who have choices to decide to become teachers, mm -hmm. rather than, and this may be a stereotype, but there is a community perception that I hear which is, some people go into teaching because they want to go into university and it's their only or last option. And I think perhaps there's a possibility that if you say, here's a minimum, you can then start the broader discussion about why teaching and you've all described the answer because it's awesome yes. to be a teacher. And that, Sorry, I know that's a question rather than a comment, but it just meant that maybe this announcement could be the possibility for some more change. Rather be real, than a end. realist about it too, doesn't it in the end have to be more than an ATAR score? Doesn't it have to be an investment yeah. in the wage and, and, the, and the career path of teachers yeah. so they go, this is a good life? Yes. Not just to, yeah, it can't just be yes. about service. No. Nothing, no profession is just about service. It has to be about a reward, reward as well. Absolutely, yeah. I, I think you're quite right. I had a conversation with a friend just last week and they said, Rosie, if you had to pick a number, what would you pick? And I said, oh, 70? As a random number, I had that conversation last week. I said, but then, that's a minimum, but there'd be people who did not get 70 who would get interviewed as well because they have other dispositions, as you said, which would be awesome teachers, as you said. So it's just setting something, isn't it? It's trying to make some change. But I fear the way it was announced today didn't have the rest of that thinking surrounding it. We're not storytellers. Well, well put. Yeah, well put. Um, I think it's also an issue for the regions, um, and we're, if we're talking about access here, um, you know, uh, there's a, a lot of data, a lot of um, information from us, and as a as a regional university that La Trobe is, um, it is really complex to kind of, um, you know, have opportunities for for regional, remote, rural students who really are mm. depressed and feel like they don't have the access. And, mm. and if you don't give opportunities to grow the regions, not take them out or bring people to it and then leave, but grow from within, I think, you know, if the ATAR is, and it won't be, but if it is a measure um, that isn't actually uh, attained to a whole range of other things, then the regions miss out because the regions actually, like Mildura, like Shepparton, you know, really um, rely on education and teacher education and the school communities for a whole range of employ employer um, opportunities. I think we have another question up there, then we'll come over here. So. Hi, I, um, this is, I guess, partly a comment and also a question. Um, I know that La Trobe has the Aspire program, which is, Part, which is about not just valuing the ATAR as the be all and end all, um, it's uh, valuing community contribution as well as your ATAR. I'm just wondering, you know, following on from talk about community values and, and you know, not just being an ATAR, is that more the direction that you see selection going in? Um, you know, things like volunteer work and uh, working within your schools as a leader and those sorts of things yeah. for admission into university in general and, and maybe teacher well, education yeah. as well? Yeah, um, if, I was to, if I'm answering that as myself, not on behalf of the uni, because I haven't had that discussion with the uni, but absolutely, they're the sort of qualities that you want. You want people who are going to give back to society, you want people who have got a broader commitment to other people, you want people to be empathic, you want people to be 
um, have a love of learning themselves, and they can display that in so many ways. And you think, yep, they've got the potential, the potential to be a good teacher, because that's what it's about. It's displaying a potential to grow and continue to grow. Um, We've got so a couple yes, more questions to get through because we are running down the clock now. So uh, there were a couple of people over here that wanted to ask. Hi, my name's Kendall. I just wanted to say thank you, first of all, to the panel for your insights. It's been really interesting. Um, I'm a secondary teacher of about seven years now and I'm about to start maternity leave. And I, going more so back to what John was discussing with the hoops that we jump through and, um, and the, re the teacher retainment, um, I'm at a point in my career where I feel that whilst I've always felt very passionate and very um, inspired by my own students and whatnot, when I'm in the classroom, I'm now at a point where as soon as I step out of the classroom, um, I'm, I'm finding it hard to enjoy my career and I'm now contemplating whether or not I'll come back from mat leave, um, which actually breaks my heart because it's something I've never seen myself do anything else. And so I'm just wondering, um, you know, for other teachers that might be in the room or people that know teachers that are feeling this way, what advice you might have to those of us that know it's what we're meant to do, but we feel stuck on a merry-go-round, lost in the craze of leadership and people bigger than us making decisions that we don't get as much of a voice in and we, w we really care, but we feel burnt out and overwhelmed by the pressures that we're put under. What advice might you have to someone like me to make sure that... I do come back and that the short-term contract is, uh, you know, opened up again for me so I can keep going. So I'm just curious to know your thoughts on that. I think taking a break, which you're doing by, uh, perforce by being pregnant, is um, you'll know whether you miss it or not pretty, pretty soon after you step out of the profession. And uh, it may be that you want to go and do something different for a while in job terms, and at some stage, you'll either feel the urge to go back or you won't. But if you're... I wrote myself a note when I was teaching in a very poor school many years ago, which was, if you honestly cannot change the situation you're in, you have to get out. And if you're in a really toxic school that's going downhill and there's no possibility of change or no hope of change, just you need to find another one. There are good schools out there, but it takes a bit of searching to find them. And good... <laughs> <laughs> and good secondary schools are harder to find than good primary schools, I would mm. argue. Can I say to you just to be kind to yourself? You don't have to have an answer and you don't have to have the answer today or tomorrow, that you've got time, as John said, to reflect and to think about it, but you don't have to make a decision now. Be kind to yourself. You've done a good job, I'm sure, in the time you've been there, and now it's time for you to do something else. And life constantly reimagined is a wonderful thing. Good luck. <laughs> There's another question yeah, for your... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My, um, my name's Sinead, I'm Kendall's younger sister and she encouraged me to go into teaching um, and I'm just finishing my first year as a, as a graduate. Um, and my question is, very, is sort of linked to Kendall's for those of us, um, I, I hear a lot from the people that I, that I learn from every day and my colleagues and um, people feeling so disempowered by the system that they're in and what we can do from that grassroots level to um, feel like we can make a difference um, in, in spite of the bureaucracy that we're controlled by. You're making a difference every day. I, I, my, I would suggest to you is that I used to talk about every person in the school's a leader. You're a leader of your classroom, you're a leader of your faculty, and you have to, as John said, focus on the things you can change. And if you can change, the dynamic in your classroom, the dynamic in the staff room, the dynamic in your faculty, bit by bit, schools can make change. But don't get, try not to, and it's easier for us to say it up here, to be overwhelmed with those, by those really big ones. Break it down into smaller chunks and be a leader of self first. Take responsibility for yourself and then take responsibility for those people with whom you have those interactions. Can I, and can I just say, uh, referring back to my story earlier on, uh, about John Kilner, my English teacher. You probably don't know, maybe at the time, when you have an impact. I don't think John knew. No. John didn't know. He kind of knew that... that Because I'd had a, a life in the public eye for a long time, he kind of knew what, what I'd done professionally and whatnot and took a little bit of pride in it. It wasn't until I hosted an event for him down at the Melbourne Town Hall for an education age where I got on the stage and said, the only reason why I'm here yep. is 
that man there. And mm. his jaw hit the floor. He didn't know that mm. his impact on me was so profound. I should have probably told him earlier. So <laughs> I, I think I hadn't seen him for 20 just, years and he yeah. caught, you know, I, made the, I went and helped him. Um, so you, you don't know, really, those little victories that you might have can have profound impact on people. And teachers all over the world would yeah. say that, that they, a student came up to them and said, you changed my life. And you didn't know that thing. Oh, really? Did I? Yeah. And all of us, as great teachers, because most teachers are great teachers. Many teachers are great teachers. I'm sure you've all... You know, the, the fact that you're here tells people. me that the commitment of these people... That's true. You know, you're already displaying something about yourself by I, being I here. I think in your situation you have an obligation to be mm. subversive by the sound of it, and you, that, <laughs> takes, that takes strength and it takes courage, mm. but it's important for the students' sake that you are subversive and that you continue to sabotage the system if it's so toxic and so destructive mm. that uh, that is the only it's like Thoreau said the only place in an immoral society the only place for a moral person is in jail and <laughs> so uh, get a good lawyer <laughs> yes yeah, so, well I used to think in a badly run school the only place for a, a really authentic student was in detention and uh, it's kind of there's an analogy for teachers there I think uh, uh, and I think um, I mean what's really key with both of your examples is, is back to what we started with, is that level of risk. And mm. teachers and teaching is hard. Mm. It's a very hard job. And there are times where you need to reflect and bring it all back, but it is also a risk and, and, and a pushing back and an advocacy for whether it's an individual or a group or a particular way of thinking or um, you know a, a kind of a way forward. That is actually our job, um, and it's hard. And sometimes you do have to retreat and come back. Sometimes you have to, you know, um, sort out, do mapping and planning, and then go back. But, you know, the work of teaching is, is so complex. It's not just classroom engagement. It's just so integrated and, and web-like, and it feels like that. Sometimes you're trapped in it. Um, but there are so many opportunities and your effects of what you do uh, as, you know, like your example, you don't know until one day you're blown away. I think, unfortunately, we've only got time for one more because we're over time, aren't we, Christina? Sorry. Yeah, I just want to, my name is Mike, by the way. Uh, I just want to come back to one of the, you, well, three points you guys made earlier, talking about um, teacher development, learning new learning spaces and how you can be creative with them, um, and then linking it to universities. Uh, I find that a lot of time the idea of these new learning spaces often get thrust upon staff mm -hmm. and no, no professional developments mm -hmm. ever given. Mm -hmm. Here, have this fantastic interactive whiteboard, but yeah. you're using it as a glorified projector. <laughs> this yeah. is a major challenge that, that I think as teachers have. And you were talking about um, teacher development, especially in the early stages. Yeah. I think something that is lacking, I know we're like coaching and mentoring are, are becoming much more catchphrases now as we move forward. Um, uh, not necessary catchphrases, that's probably the wrong term, but anyway, um, the idea that perhaps linking professional development with universities to, to develop some sort of like a, a certificate, a graduate certificate, to build teacher capacity as you move forward and, and maybe even add to the future potential for a master's or anything along those lines, I think would really give direction to professional development. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's just chaotic experiences with professional development. The teachers just go, hey, I'll, I'll, I think I'll take, a, I, I'm loud enough without it. Um, <laughs> uh, I think I'll take, uh, you know, something on, you know, uh, my example, environmental science, I'll do something in environmental science, and it doesn't really pr provide really valuable learning uh, mm -hmm. for myself, whereas when I try and find something valuable learning, it, it, what, what teachers I think would like to do is add to their kind of repertoire and, and, and get something that's kind of valued to other employers and a noticeable thing like that. So like providing opportunities, at the end of the trove, is there any opportunity in the future or potential for a lot of us, say a master's, uh, looking into professional development and looking at kind of creating this pathway for teachers to develop beyond graduate four years, three years, whatever you may Joanna, that's um, your territory? Um, that's absolutely key to any kind of um, development of, of teacher education, but also how we engage with our alumni, our teachers, our partners um, as they move into the profession and how we can actually um, work collaboratively in that space. Um, at, at La Trobe, um, this year was 
focused on putting forward some new teacher education programs. Next year is very much focused on a trajectory around some really key grad certs, um, master's pathway, so that the partnership arrangement and the professional development is targeted, it's meaningful, it's collaborative and it's iterative. I think, you know, teachers will go out and they'll start teaching and, you know, if somebody was to say to you, come and start a master's, you'd probably fall over. But if there's a PD that then leads to, you know, opportunities to complete assessment, have a credit into a master's or a grad cert and, and sort of build a kind of learning passport as you're moving out of a teacher education program is what we are focused on for La Trobe. Hey, I think I'm getting in trouble if I stay any longer up here. But look, I just want to say thank you all for coming along. Uh, don't forget we have uh, some drinks and canapes for you to enjoy outside here to continue the conversation. Uh, go to Put Bold Thinking Series in your search engine. It will pop up. You'll be able to check out the website. The audio of this will be available pretty soon. Pretty straight away if you want to go back and, or want to share it with other people as well. Uh, put it on your Facebook page. Take it to your school. Um, uh, it's not just about tonight, it's about sharing the experience well beyond today. Thank you to our panellists as well. They've been wonderful uh, and they're very busy people. Joanna, John, Rosa. And stay tuned for um, next year's Bold Thinking series. If we, I think we're going to continue to think bold, aren't we, Tim? We are. Have a great time out there tonight.